call to order a uh, special hearing of the Montpelier Planning Commission uh, for November 29th. Um, we first have to have the Planning Commission approve the agenda. So um, if if someone from the Planning Commission could uh, move to approve the agenda. This is Gabe by motion to approve the agenda. Okay, give me a second. I'll second it. Second from Ariane. Those in favor of approving the agenda, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. So that brings us to comments from the chair. And I'm sorry that uh, we're getting off to a bad, slow start here. So I'm going to try to uh, make these comments quick. First, welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to the meeting. This meeting is really about hearing feedback and public comment. Um, so really appreciate it. it. Looks like we have a lot of people in attendance. Uh, the process for tonight, for tonight basically is going to be that the planning director, Mike, is going to summarize some proposed changes to the river ha hazard area and the uh, zoning bylaws. Um, these are these are things that are feedback from the public, things to consider. Some of them are feedback also from the planning commission from, and from Mike. Um, uh, after he summarizes these proposed changes or possible changes, uh, the planning commission will have an opportunity to ask for some clarifications just for some details, but the meeting's really not here for, uh, it's not, it's not happening for the planning commission to deliberate. It's not happening for the planning commission to ask a lot of questions for information gathering. Uh, the deliberations are going to happen later. Uh, the planning commission will be deliberating over, over these, uh, proposals in December or January. It's, it's, it's not going to happen tonight. Um, as I said before, that tonight's going to be about public comment. So uh, before I before I move on, I will say that when when the planning commission does deliberate, just so that everyone has an idea of the process that we go through, uh, we're going to be considering any proposed changes through the lens of what our city plan says, what the regional plan says, uh, the vision that we've had all along for the zoning bylaws, because you know they're a living document, and and as the planning commission works on this, we we anticipate making changes. So we'll be looking at it like that. It's uh, it's it's a big picture thing. Is what we're going to be looking at. Just so you know. Um, so anyway, tonight's about comments. It's about hearing from you. We're not going to talk too much uh, because there's a lot of people, and because we want to make sure everyone gets heard. We're gonna to try to set a limit of two minutes per comment. And I'm really sorry that we got off to a slow start. And I, I, I hope that doesn't come back to bite us. Um, if, we, if we have two minute long comments uh, and we're making good time, there might be a possibility for, for further comments from the same people. But at first we're gonna to try to give everyone two minutes. So with that, uh, I don't have any more comments. Um, uh, so next on the agenda, we have to move on to, to general business uh, because it's a planning commission meeting. Uh, general business would be something other than the bylaws. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and move on to that and ask if anyone's here, if anyone's here and wants to, to discuss something or mention something to us that's not related to the proposed changes for tonight. Anyone here for something else? Okay. Uh, with that, I'm going to move on and turn it over to Mike to uh, give us the summary of the proposed changes to the river hazard area regulations and the unified development regulations. Thanks, Mike. All right, so uh, I'm coming through okay? Yep, yep, we can hear you. Okay. Um, so, I'm going to assume everybody has received the memo because I can shorten up this this presentation portion considerably uh, and just kind of summarize where uh, and what a lot of these are. And let me just make sure everybody's on mute. So, yeah, Mike, why don't you um, make sure you share in case people want to pull it up right now, tell them where they can do that. I meant to say that before. Ah, OK. Uh, I would have to, and that's the tricky part because I'm now on this computer, not on my computer. So I can't, it's okay. It's okay. One of us planning commissioners will share it in the comments. If people can, if people need a link, we can. Oh, if there. people need a link. Yes. 
um, if you don't have a copy. Um, so what we had uh, as staff and as a city is we periodically get zoning permits uh, that, that come in or requests or information come in from time to time. And we just start to compile these up and eventually uh, put them together when we get enough of them and go through and try to do a zoning amendment to, to make a number of changes. So over the past nine months, since the last time we've had this, we received what you had received in the mail or um, by downloading it on the website, um, which was a list of 10 groups of changes. Um, and so the changes I'll summarize here for anyone who hasn't read through them or gone through them. Um, but uh, we'll, I'll try not to go into too many details because I think everybody has this and everyone has looked at it. Um, so the changes, um, and let me take a half step back just to go through and say this is the first of two hearings. So there'll be a second hearing on, this, on December 13th. We wanted to give as much pos uh, time possible for people. Uh, you can always send in, if you're viewing this on ORCA at a later date, you can always email written comments uh, to, to me, Mike Miller. I'm the planning director here for the city of Montpelier. Um, or you can provide comments at either one of these two hearings. So that's kind of the summary of the hearings uh, of what we're going to be doing. Uh, so the first big change that we received, uh, not necessarily big change, but first significant change is uh, a map change in the Harrison Ave, Whittier Ave area, um, which would shift. This area is currently zoned residential 6,000. So that is, um, it's in the same neighborhood as College Street. So it's, it's kind of got grouped in with College Street when the zoning was amended in 2018. So it's a, a residential 6,000 as opposed to say uh, Loomis or Lower Liberty Street, which would be um, residential 3,000. So what the 3,000 and the 6,000 stand for is the number of square feet that a lot has to be to be conforming. And it's also the density of development. So it's one unit per 6,000 with a 6,000 square foot lot or one per 3,000 with 3,000 square foot lot. So that kind of gives a little bit of an outline uh, we had a project, um, a gentleman was, uh, his, him and his wife looking at a project to put in a tiny house, it would put, a, uh, they already have a house in an accessory apartment, this would put another unit, um, but it's not allowed because they don't have enough density, even though they have a quarter acre lot, which is uh, about uh, 10 or 11,000 square feet. So the idea of this change would be to make this pair have area the same zoning designation as Loomis and uh, Liberty Streets in those areas, uh, and that would be residential one, uh, residential 3000. So that was a little bit of where that one came from, and we can answer questions about that one uh, when this wraps up. The second one was uh, up at Heaton Street. So Washington County Mental Health came in and was looking at a project to put in some workforce housing. Uh, there, they want to put some housing next to their parking lot, and uh, the zoning district uh, residential six thousand again. So they are again in that six thousand uh, College Street neighborhood, and so uh, we found these. Uh, we looked at Heaton Woods Long Term Care Facility and Washington County Mental Health as kind of being unique properties within that neighborhood and identified them as a possibility. One possibility would be that they could get rezoned to residential 3000, which would make them more conforming. So it wouldn't make them conforming, but would make them more conforming and would give them the ability to add in that additional housing. So um, the third proposal uh, is on Northfield Street, uh, and that was to shift two parcels on the east side from mixed use residential and rural to residential nine. Uh, this is a project, uh, many, so it was associated with uh, um, Central Vermont Habitat for Humanity is looking at doing a project on that parcel. Um, in order to do that project, they would need to have residential 9,000. And they're going to be doing a project, uh, a planning project next year 
to look at the feasibility, but they really need to know whether or not they can have that zoning designation before they can spend the money, you know, before spending $60,000 or $100,000 planning for a project, they really have to know whether that zoning designation is gonna be um, made. So that way they're, they can be very efficient with their money. Uh, the fourth proposal is to make an adjustment to the side setbacks in the residential 9,000 district. This is town-wide. Um, it, because residential 9,000 is in a lot of places. It's one of our larger zoning districts. Um, you can find it um, everywhere from you know Northfield Street to Elm Street to um, uh, to a couple other uh, places up on Berlin Street. So there are a number of places that have this. So occasionally um, setbacks are currently 15 feet. That in some of these neighborhoods that becomes um, tight or makes a few non-conforming. So we had a request to look at whether or not that should go to 10 feet. So a 10 foot setback would mean each house is at least 20 feet apart from each other. When it's 15 feet, that requires each house to be 30 feet apart because each one is, has 15 feet. So that, that can really start to separate and spread out neighborhoods. Uh, and you really lose a lot of density when you start to have side setbacks that are um, that, that wide. So that was that proposal. Fifth proposal is change setbacks um, for rail lines. This really affects one group of people um, who are over in the, the Eastern Gateway Farm and Factory neighborhood. So this is um, over where the skating rink is um, and uh, the, the John Deere dealer. So those, those area. And so there are a number of these rails, rail lines that are abandoned over there. So they wanted to have the setback, which is currently actually quite large at 20 feet, uh, adjusted so that way it would either be um, five feet or zero feet and so we'll talk about that a little bit more we had recommended five feet and i know uh alicia's here and I, they emailed written comments that i forwarded to the planning commission that said they reached out to to the rail division and i have copies of those emails and the rail division is okay with the zero setback that they had wanted so we can talk more about that um Provided there was a um, uh, an agreement with the rail, and so I've sent I forwarded that information along. Uh, number six is new planned unit development rules. This actually dates back to when the old when we replaced the zoning in 2018. One thing that was pointed out that was missing was that we really didn't have any general planned unit development regulations. We have these specialty ones you know, cottage cluster and, and new new neighborhood. Um, but we really didn't have any general PUDs. And a lot of times that comes up um, by developers. You don't get any density bonuses. You don't get anything. You just go through and say, you know, uh, I've got a certain amount of land. That portion is not developable. I'd like to cluster the development up here. And when you cluster it up here, it conserves the back area that can't be developed anymore. So that's how these PUDs work. And so usually there's two types, a general PUD and what's called a footprint PUD. And uh, not to get into too much of the details, uh, a footprint PUD happens a lot with condominiums where you will own, you might own the townhouse and two feet around the townhouse, but you don't actually, you know, you, you share the land. So everybody might have a piece with a little bit of land. Some condos, you don't own any land and if you don't own any land you don't need a PUD but there so basically you can find some condos that are just um, you own the walls but you don't own the land those don't need a subdivision those don't need a PUD this is a, a secondary type that you'll sometimes see um, where there is some subdivision of the land um, and that's what the footprint PUDs look at um, so number Seven is to remove the required PUD language in new neighborhood and conservation PUDs. This has came up a couple times uh, that uh, there are some problems with those, uh, and sometimes people get forced into them, even though they don't, you know, they don't need the density bonuses, they don't want the density bonuses, but because they're doing a project in a certain neighborhood, they're forced into the PUD, and it makes more problems, um, in my opinion. So my recommendation is leave it as an option. If you want to use it and you want to get a density bonuses, 
by all means, you can use it, but you're not going to be forced into using it. Um, number eight was the removal of uh, residential density requirements from riverfront and residential 1500 districts. This would make the next two highest density districts to be regulated by bulk and massing. So uh, you'll sometimes hear planners talk about form based codes. Uh, where really what we want to do in some of these neighborhoods is regulate the size of the buildings. Um, and so whether you put four apartments in that building or six apartments in that building or, or you know, uh, is less important than what the building shape and everything looks like. And so that is true of our urban centers one, two, and three. We have no residential density requirements in urban center one, two, and three. And the Planning Commission has requested that we consider this same concept for riverfront and for 1500, um, those two zoning districts. So that's what number eight would be looking at. Number nine looks at a number of minor, what I call minor technical fixes. So these are a lot of things the zoning administrator picks up on. Um, uh, some of the definition of nature, recreational park, splitting that into two pieces. Um, some clarifications to accessory setbacks to clarify um, when an accessory structure is attached to a principal structure. I mean, some of these things you just wouldn't think of until you get a permit and try to figure out a garage is an accessory structure that has this setback. What happens if the garage touches or is part of the house? Does the garage meet the garage setback or is the garage now because it's touching the primary structure have to meet the primary setback? It's those types of questions that that the zoning administrator just needs to have to understand how this works. So that's um, clarification uh, of when the development receives a state wetland permit that it doesn't need a hearing. A um, couple of things dealing with signs. Um, signs are routinely always need to get those tweaked. Um, some clarification on fences, especially front yard fences. Um, a typo, uh, some clarification on land use uh, or landscaping requirements for when they trigger a full review. Uh, some discussion of uh, shading requirements. So certain projects uh, you have to check to see if you're gonna be shading another property. And uh, so there's an amendment that's been recommended there to not do walls, yards, and roofs, but instead, but instead just require that we protect permitted or existing solar devices. So that's kind of a, a recommended change there. And the last is uh, some subdivision changes. Um, it's a strike because it's redundant. Uh, we don't need it in two places. And then the last thing, number 10, is just the river hazard, which were interim rules that were adopted in 2020 that uh, we have to make permanent. Um, and then in addition of a reference to where those changes were made. So that's really quick, the 10 changes. So I'll ask Kirby here, do you just go through these one at a time, just go and try to get everybody's comments who want to comment on number one. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Yeah. Or would um, you I like just, to just start getting comments? Uh, yeah, I think that's a. I think that's great. We're gonna we're gonna go through uh, according to Mike's memo. I just put a link uh, directly to that document in the chat. If anyone, um, if it helps anyone follow along, uh, we're gonna open things up. Uh, well, first we have to ask: Do any of the planning commissioners have any questions before we proceed? Before we open it up for comment. Anyone need any clarifications on any of those 10 items? Okay, that's great. Uh, so before we, uh, before we then move on to, to open things up, just wanna let people know that, uh, like I said before, we're gonna keep things to, to two minutes. You can follow along by the issues. Uh, so we'll be following uh, Mike's memo, this, this, the links there. And uh, I'm gonna ask that people use the, um, use the raise hand function on Zoom uh, to let me know that you uh, would like to make a comment on a particular uh, 
issue as we bring them up one at a time. And uh, for the so the people who have used the raise hand function, I'll, I will call on on them, and I'll let you know. Uh, so we see we have a we have a person who used the raise hand function. So does anyone need a need any? Uh, Starting with number learning? one. <laughs> um, and literally one of these, not 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 all of them. I'm really busy right now, Chad. Okay, guys. Uh, so with that, I'm going to open it up to uh, to comments, and we're going to start on the first issue. Um, the first issue is the map change in Harrison Avenue, Whittier Avenue uh, area. So I, we have we have some hands here. I I think I saw Joanne before. So Joanne, would you like to Joan. to give it? Or jo Joan, I'm sorry. I. Um, yeah, I, so I live on Harrison Avenue. Um, my husband and I are the ones who actually brought up this issue. And so we would be in favor of having that zoning change. And we've also talked with quite a few of our neighbors about it. Um, to, and most folks have been uh, overall supportive of the idea. Um, I, I haven't heard anybody say that they thought it was a terrible idea and, and lots of people felt like it would have a positive impact on them as well if they ever wanted to um, change something about their home um, in a similar way to what we've been talking about. Thanks, thanks. Is there anything more? Um, no, I think that's it. Thank you. Okay, I think I noticed uh, Peter next. Uh, I'm Peter Kalman. I actually live on the other side of town, but I used to live in College Street. And Mike, I just have a question for you. I was looking at the map and I just wondered why you didn't make the same proposal for uh, the uh, upper end of Liberty Street, right at the bottom of um, uh, where uh, Heaton, uh, because you're also recommending Heaton. And I, I remember when I lived over there, I looked at a house um, on Liberty, 56 Liberty, which I assumed was a Res 3000, and it would have made a great, uh, the upper part of it would have made a great uh, subdivided road that would, uh, a house that could be on the upper road, but, but it turned out to be 6,000. Why, if you look at the map, you see this, this wash of yellow all around it. Why not extend that wash of yellow that is Res 3000 further? Thanks. I agree. So the question is, why wouldn't we run more up uh, Liberty Street on for Res 3000? I mean, it really just hasn't been, we haven't taken a look at it. It's certainly one we could take a, a look at. Um, I'm trying to think back now to the original, we, we had many, many hearings over the uh, 2016, 17, 18 to, to get the adoption done. And I'm not sure there was a, a reason that it was kind of broken off where it was, um, you know, because certainly Liberty, we could go up farther on Liberty. Um, I don't think Marvin Street would make any sense though. But um, again, the, we just looked in at this particular proposal just at that one area just half and half because it did once it was pointed out to us it kind of made sense it, was, it did bring up the question of especially those three properties you know you look at loomis street and you have everyone but three properties that are either res 1500 or res 3000 and then you've got these three properties that are res 6000 it kind of is out of place so we were very narrow we tried to be very narrow in our recommendation um it's certainly one uh we could, I, I would leave it, it's a policy question. It would be up to the planning commission at this point. That's that's why we aren't, we, we weren't looking to open up and look at the entire map. We were looking exclusively at uh, what makes sense for the requests that were brought in. Yeah, um, I think we will be considering 
changes like that though, Peter, when we, when we deliberate later. So thanks for pointing that out. Um, do we have any more hands for the first change from the memo for Harrison and Whittier? Okay, I'm not, I'm not seeing any. Uh, so we can move on to the second change uh, from, from Mike's list anyway, uh, which is for Heaton Woods and the WCMH uh, area. And it looks like we have some hands now. Um, I'm just going to name them as I, as I see them. Um, I think I saw Polly first. Thank you. Um, so I actually wanted to speak about all three of the map changes, Harrison, Northfield Street and Heaton Street, but for efficiency, I'll do it now. Um, and I, I wanted to speak in support of these changes because I think that the increased density will facilitate more house, the creation of more housing in Montpelier. And I mean, this isn't the time to go through um, a, a description of, of Montpelier's housing shortage. Certainly it's been going on for years, but it's it's definitely as bad, um, if not worse than it's ever been. There's, there's no vacancies, rents are high, when things come up for sale, there are bidding wars and, and properties tend to go under contract within a couple of days. Um, and these proposed changes, um, are precipitated by individuals and organizations who actually want to create more housing in, in Montpelier, which will help relieve um, our very, very constrained market. I also think that they are logical because they extend the densities and the permit requirements on abutting parcels and neighborhoods. It's not like they're plopped in the middle of nowhere. Um, and I guess just one final comment about Heaton Street. Um, you know, since I've been um, involved in housing in, in Montpelier, there's been a lot of talk from employers and economic development folks about the lack of housing for employees and people who, who, who work here. And um, it sounds like Washington County Mental Health is trying to provide some housing for their employees, but they need a change of density to make it work. So I hope that um, the Planning Commission will say yes to these three changes, Harrison, Northfield Street, and Heaton Street. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Polly. Uh, I think I saw Abby next. Yes, hi. Um, I'm, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I guess I wanted some clarification. Um, you presented, Mike, that Washington County Mental Health wanted to put in workforce housing. Um, however, there's been a recent article in The Bridge when Michael Curtis, who is a consultant for Washington County, um, was interviewed and he said that the housing that they would be interested in wouldn't be for the workforce, it would be for their clients. And there might possibly be, you know, a small workforce part of it, but the main thrust would be for their clients. And so I'm just wondering if this is uh, I just want this up on the table because it seems like the motivation for housing is great, but that's not what the main intent of the Washington County housing might be. It's, I think Keith can maybe answer that question. Sure. Hi, folks. My name is Keith Greer. I'm the director of the Community Support Program here at Washington County Mental Health Services. And actually, one of my offices is out of Heaton Street. Uh, thanks, everybody, for being here. So, yeah, I'm not sure exactly where that narrative came from in terms of specifically for, um, for our employees, although I will say in recent months, we've run into more and more. I think that many of you are aware 
of our uh, extreme staffing crises that we have, not only in Washington County, but all across our social service organizations. So it has come up on more than one occasion in terms of staff interested to come work for us and couldn't find housing. But that's not what that was not our primary intention. We've actually engaged in a feasibility study uh, for uh, housing on our property there uh, at Heaton Street. And I think most relevant to this conversation, that little plot of land that's the woods next to the uh, parking lot there. And I think that's why changing from and I, I don't understand all the details either, um, Mike. Uh, so I might need to get educated, but moving it from res six to res three would allow us to put in family housing. And that has to be a focus for us right now is that we can look at uh, apartment housing for folks, but what really families need right now is family housing. And we were looking at developing some uh, so houses there, keeping in accordance with sort of like the fascia, the, the, uh, the vibe of the neighborhood, if you will. But that's what we were looking at and that uh, where the woods are there. Does that make sense to you guys? That's, that's, so it wasn't originally all just for, uh, staff housing. It really is for people served and families specifically who need that kind of housing. All right. So that's my my apologies. I was I met once uh, when there was a, a TRC meeting, a technical review committee, where they were coming in and talking, and that was how it was presented to me was that it was going to be for employees. So it may not have been a fixed, uh, apparently a fixed idea. And they, there must have been some change or some miscommunication at that point um, because I only met once with them. So uh, the Planning Commission will have to take that into consideration. Now, from a, from a regulatory standpoint, um, as zoning is written, uh, if, it's not, if it's not treatment, if it's just housing, uh, then it is, it's, um, there's no discrimination in the zoning between housing for somebody who uh, is, um, say, uh, say, a Washington County mental health client or somebody who is just, uh, you know, uh, somebody who's just uh, living there because it's, a, it's an apartment. So the zoning doesn't differentiate between those two. It's, it's both of them are just living arrangements unless you reach a another level where there's a state licensing so if it's a state licensed facility then it falls into a separate category um, but as long as it's just housing uh, it wouldn't be discriminated against um, in that way so i hope that um, I, I apologize for the uh, lack of um, for not being correct in the memo uh, as i said that was if had i Kind of heard about that earlier. I would have sent out a clarifying note on that, but um, so thank you for clearing uh, clearing that up, Keith. My pleasure, and it is our intention uh, again through this feasibility study for housing. We we know uh, that individuals in our community, um, to I believe it was Polly's point, it's just not a lot of housing, guys. We need to create some housing, so we are uh, we are looking for opportunities to do so. Thanks for letting me share. Yeah, Keith, did you have anything else? Uh, you had your hand up. I just want to make sure that you I just can't figure out how to get it down now, Kirby. I, <laughs> <laughs> I can ignore it. That's fine. Uh, I believe that uh, Eve was was next. OK, actually, it might be one question for Keith again. Uh, just curious on the process. Um, was there actually a request for the change in the zone or was this just a discussion? Uh, our, I guess our concern, uh, please, yeah, answer. So early on in this process, we heard that uh, this group was considering uh, some zoning changes and we wanted to understand those as part of our uh, feasibility uh, study for whether or not we could actually do this. So I'm wondering, uh, Mike, if that's what happened, we were reaching out to try to figure out, okay, if we're gonna go forward. Are there gonna be any zoning uh, challenges in terms of us uh, moving forward? So the process, as far as uh, as far as I know, was that um, so just so everybody understands the the way the planning department's kind of laid out, we have uh, two folks, uh, Audra and Meredith, who are handle all the zoning and all the permitting and all that that those pieces. 
we have Kevin Casey who who does the housing programs and I'm the planner planning director. Um, some of you may know Chris who does inspect and they can't see us either. So, so that's kind of the way that the things are laid out now Washington County mental health had been working with Meredith uh, on some ideas for the Heaton street property. Uh, I was not involved at all didn't even know it was going on. Um, but she had a, a meeting a sit down meeting where they came in and started to talk about their proposals and she pretty much my understanding is informed them that you can't do the pro proposal because you don't have the density there's just not enough density there in order for you to, to do the project that you want. You would need to be at least a residential 3000 which is one one de zoning designation higher. Um, so uh, at that time she was like but. Uh, you know, the planning commission is getting ready to hold some hearings. If you want to include that that uh, request to make that zoning change, we could we could look at that at the same time as we look at all the other pieces. So uh, that was the first I heard about it. I came into the room. They said, "Can you do this?" And I said, uh, "You know, I'll review what we see on the map because we can't just change the zoning for one property." So uh, Meredith and I looked at the maps and we examined and, and kind of said, "Well." You know, Washington County Mental Health and the um, Heaton Woods Long Term Care Facility are both unique properties. We both we could if we we can't just rezone the one, but we could rezone both uh, to kind of make those two residential three thousand. Um, not that Heaton Woods has any interest in doing anything, but um, these are significantly larger structures. Uh, they exceed most of their non-conforming, very much non-conforming to, to many of the requirements of residential 6,000. Um, remember, this is a neighborhood um, that really is composed of uh, single family, two family, um, maybe some three family housing, and these are significantly larger. So we put the proposal together. Um, that's the only communication I've had um, until tonight with anyone from Washington County Mental Health. Okay, so then my only other comment would be about Heaton Woods uh, backing up. I'm on Fuller Street, so I do know Heaton Woods well. And we know that now that there's a 3.2 acre easement, conservation easement and city park, and a lot of steep slopes around it. So, so basically it's sort of the parking area and the 14,000 foot square foot thing. And the first part of the park, most of the parking lot, but it has a fair amount of parking space. So it's not really, um, Clearly, uh, I mean, not, not too obvious to us that it would be a great place to build, but kind of like putting it into the, it in uh, as a way to make the other one work, which would be fine. But if it does become a place where tight building is going to be put in, I think it wouldn't exactly meet the Res 6 nature of the neighborhood, as a lot of the documents say you're trying to uh, each neighborhood distinct character and quality in, in, in those. Um, areas might not be quite uh, quite meeting that particular feature of, of the uh, planning document. Okay, you broke up a little bit, but I think I, I, I got the, the gist you're, you're referring then across the street to the to the facility across the street that with the steep slopes and the conservation easement, um, there's not much on that side. Um, and I, I you know, I, I agree. I mean, there's, there hasn't been a proposal, so I can't even say that there is a potential, but, um, you know, looking at the facilities, if somebody ever wanted to add some additional units in there, um, whether it's a, a second story on a part of a building or something, then they would have some additional density to, to, to use um, at, at the long-term care facility, but nobody's proposing anything at this time. I certainly Certainly, uh, it should be obvious. I hope it's obvious to everyone that you, uh, regardless of the zoning change, the conservation easement doesn't change. Nobody can build in the conserved land. Uh, the steep slopes since 2018. So in 2018, we added new zoning um, that strictly regulates development on steep slopes. So before 2018, we didn't have any rules on building on steep steep slopes. 2018, we did add in those new rules. So um, uh, they are. There, it, there's there's additional protections now, so it, Washington County, you know, in a lot of cases, not everybody builds out to full 
development potential. Um, most properties in the city you'll see are, are you know less than fully developed, and I would you know wouldn't be surprised to see Washington County mental health say with the bit with that in that same category, or not Washington County, but the, the Eaton Woods. Thanks, thanks, Mike. Thanks, Eve. Uh, uh, next, we have uh, Jay Castellano. Uh, Joe, oh, thanks, Kirby. Yeah. Joe, yeah. Um, hey, I just have a question for Keith and or Mike. Um, how many units, Keith, are you proposing? Housing units are you proposing under uh, this plan? Well, it's difficult saying. You know, we have uh, an architect came in and sort of gave us like the the dream, the, the vision of what that could be, um, inclusive of renovating Heaton Street into like a, you know, apartment uh, buildings. Total though, like, so the total number like that we could possibly based upon those uh, drawings up is like tw a little over 20 units, 22, I think. But the ones that would be in addition to the like the actual Heaton Street renovation, if you will, we're looking at four, possibly five, um, and five I think might be stretching it just given the land that I saw there. Four, so probably four like family houses. And that's really a big uh, gap that we have in our housing stock right now is uh, family housing. Uh, so that's that part. I don't know, Joe, if you live up there, but you know where like, you know where Heaton Street is? Yeah, I, it's okay. fairly close to where I live. All right, so uh, you know where the parking lot is, right? Where currently yeah. the staff do that little wood thing there along there would be where those would be. And then probably using some of the parking lot too. Across from our house. Wow. Okay. Houses though, like we're talking about like actual houses. Lots of change for our vision. So you're talking like almost townhouse style. Is that the concept at this point? Yeah, yeah. We talked a lot about that sort of keeping in with the, again, the vibe of the neighborhood. Uh, that sort of thing. The vibe of the neighborhood like that. I, I think it. I think someone's not muted, uh, and they're maybe not I aware of it. So everyone, everyone, check and make sure that you're muted if it's not your turn to talk. Thank you, Keith, for clarifying that. I appreciate that. Thanks. Do we have any other? Uh, any other comments for the second change, the Heaton Woods area? Hi, this is Dana Hope, and I, sorry, I can't figure out how to raise my hand. It's <laughs> okay, go ahead. Dana. Actually, I'm on here listening for Colonial, but as you're talking about Heaton, Heaton Woods development over there, I'm just, I have kids in elementary school, and the limited, it, this it's popped into my head is that there's right limited green space at Union Elementary School, and they use... Harrison Field and that hillside behind Harrison Field that leads up to Heaton Wood for a lot of their eco instructions. And I wonder, I guess that's concerning to me if that would be developed where then the kids are going to go with the limited green space already at the elementary school. Yeah, like what we were just talking about was uh, there's a conservation easement in that area and uh, it's it's very unlikely, if not impossible, for that to be developed. That's our understanding. Um, do we have anyone else on this topic? Okay. Yes, please hold on. Can you hear me? Yes. I apologize. I missed the raise hand button. Uh, just want to make sure we, oh, I'm sorry, I uh, jumped in too soon. Never mind. I apologize. Uh, sure. Sounds like you have uh, a, a different topic you want to talk about. Oh. Um, so, yeah, we're, we're going down a list. Did you want to? Yeah, I want to see which one on this one. I know, in, in general. So, I'll wait for the one. Oh, okay. okay. Thank you. Though. Okay. Thanks for checking I'm on that on that mic. Yeah, yeah, we're going through by by numbers at this point, so we're just yeah, on number fine. two. Okay. Okay. So, uh, anyone else on on Heaton Woods? Okay. So we're gonna move on. Uh, so the the third change is uh, map change for Northfield Street to shift some parcels 
uh, from MUR to rural um, and rural, that is to Res 9. So to the Northfield Street. So I might uh, jump in first. You want to kick this off? Uh, I can. Yeah. That sense, right? yeah, so Zach Watson is here from Central Vermont Habitat for Humanity. And so uh, we have so we have three people here in person. So I'll, I'll let him, I guess, introduce the project. And at least he'll be available to answer questions as it goes along. Thanks a lot, Mike. That's that's helpful. And welcome, Zach. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Kirby. Um, <laughs> I'm Zachariah Watson. I'm the executive director for Central Vermont Habitat for Humanity and just recovering from surgery. I got a big hole in my cheek, so excuse me if folks have a hard time hearing me, especially through the mask. Um, so, um, <clears throat> you know, first of all, just uh, want to say that, you know, we, we uh, this uh, zoning change came out of basically two requests. Um, the first was we were looking at developing one of the mixed use parcels along Northfield Street for an affordable housing uh, project. And uh, it was pretty clear that the zoning wasn't right for the project because it would have required us to build a three story building. Um, and so it was uh, it made sense for us to look at rezoning to Res 9. Um, and in the process of that, we knew that a larger development we were looking at looking at um, outlined in the, the memo that Mike sent. Right, I'm out of here. <laughs> uh, we needed uh, we needed to also change that to residential 9000 as part of our project and so it just made sense for us to do them all at the same time <clears throat> um, so basically uh, you know uh, the uh, site that we're looking at, at at the rural portion at Northfield Street is a perfect site for affordable housing and just housing in general uh, Polly talked about this earlier, and um, I don't want to get into all the details about the housing shortages that we have in central Vermont, Vermont in general, in the city. But uh, just to say that we have received letters of support from uh, from the city and the Regional Planning Commission, as well as Sustainable Montpelier, as well as a number of other organizations that say that there is an absolute need for more housing and a housing of this type. Uh, furthermore, um, you know, Habitat for Humanity has been building houses in central Vermont for 30 some odd years. Uh, and we know that this is the ideal location for affordable housing because it's walkable within our community, um, because it's close to services and very importantly, it's out of the floodplain. So the, uh, the reason we've requested uh, the rezoning for this parcel, um, it's a difficult, it's a challenging parcel to begin with. But basically, uh, the zoning is absolutely necessary because it allows for higher density. Uh, it allows for us to run sewage and water, town sewage and city water and sewage up to the parcel, uh, which again is really helpful for affordable housing. Um, it'll also ex allow for us to have access to more planned unit developments, um, which will make this project more feasible. Um, if we are able to rezone this, there is potential we could request that the parcel be expanded into a um, uh, expand a growth district, which would enable us for access to more grants and tax credits. Um, so uh, I've talked to a lot of the neighbors about this and I recognize early on that this is a parcel that is used for hiking and biking uh, by many of the neighbors. It's, um, uh, it is currently a private lot um, and the land, the homeowner is uh, you know, very open to letting folks use this lot. Um, and because of that use, um, and, and also just from our own experience um, in wanting to create more green and open space for our homeowners, uh, as part of this development, over 50%, if not more, of the parcel would be put into a forever wild easement, uh, essentially meaning that this parcel would, be come in, would become an old growth forest. Um, by having an easement, it would protect the land, which it is currently not protected. It would also enable us to put trails and bike paths, um, which would be publicly accessible uh, to not only the abutters that currently use it, but also for the entire city um, and folks on this side of the river uh, so that everybody can use this parcel because it is a great parcel. Um, but, uh, you know, so basically, I know folks have had a lot of questions about why do we need this 
in place. Uh, the reality is this is a 60 to $100,000 feasibility study just to look at whether we can actually build anything here. And we're not going to build any, we're not going to spend that money if we don't, if we don't have the zoning in place that we know that we need. So uh, simply put, if the zoning doesn't happen, we're not going to do the feasibility study and this project doesn't move forward. Um, so that's kind of the, the nuts and bolts of it. Um, I probably went over my two minutes. I apologize, Kirby. It's okay. It's okay. You, it was informational. I think a lot of people uh, wanted to hear the, uh, the, um, the detailed description. Uh, and I, I meant to say this before, and I think I feel like I'll, I'll be saying it a few times probably throughout this entire process. Uh, when we, when the planning commission and when the city considers things like like proposed changes, we, we do it based on feedback, but what, but what we don't do is, is make our decisions based solely off of one parcel or one property owner or something like that. We uh, make the decisions based on, you know, what vision we hope to have for the future. Um, so I just, I just, your comment about, uh, you know, this project may or may not happen. I mean, that's, that's fine by my perspective because we're not doing this for one person or one parcel. We'll be, we're, we're just, this is an opportunity for us to consider making the zoning better in general for the whole plan for the whole town too. Okay. Uh, I think I saw Dan Jones first. It's my, I'm calling on people randomly if you haven't noticed, by the way, basically. Hi, Kirby. Thank you for uh, calling me. I'm um, one of the far end of butters of that uh, property uh, and do use it for hiking, etc. A, a lot. I have often thought that the flat part of it up the hill could have a higher and better use. One of the things that we forget in Montpelier is that we live in a floodplain downtown and we have a massive need for housing right now. We have no place for working people to live. We have a no place for the, the people who are going to keep things going in the future. And so we have to start looking at places proximate to our downtown but because we live in this valley uh, that can be uh, developed. And we have a problem with the, the stuff downtown. One, a lot of it's controlled by the state and parking lots and stuff. And two, it's in a floodplain. My, I was having uh, dinner with my buddy uh, Roger Hill a couple of nights ago, and Roger was talking about the probability of, of floods, massive floods, being more common in the future because of climate change. And so we have to now start thinking about how can we keep our city going around our center and move stuff up out of the floodplain. So the planning for doing something residential up in that area would be crucial for being able to see how could we then imagine a future that was no longer just sitting down in the floodplain like the downtown is. Um, I can't urge enough for people to understand that this climate change thing is going to impact our future and that we do have to make some choices around it and we need the housing and so the idea of having something that would be that proximate to downtown is absolutely uh, needed and so I'm just uh, jumping in here to say please consider the uh, zoning change uh, to the residential because I think it's uh, absolutely needed. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. Uh, I think I, I noticed Noah next. Hello. Um, so I'm Hillary Goldblatt, actually, and um, my kids and I, we love walking in those woods um, on a daily basis. And so I was glad to hear, Zach, that you had um, incorporated a proposal to keep some um, access to the woods there. We have dogs. A lot of the neighbors' names I see here, we all have dogs and we know each other because of that common woods. And so um, you know, there's not really anywhere else we can walk to on our side of the river where we can get out of the city um, into the woods. But um, I understand all the housing crunch issues, but I just wanted to speak up for value of that um, undeveloped spot. Thank you. Thanks, Hillary. Uh, Dayton. Hi there, everybody. Uh, Dayton Kreitz. Um, I'm in a butter on Pleasant Street. And I just wanted to speak up and say, you know, wholehearted support behind the type of development that Habitat for Humanity is proposing, full-hearted support for the type of housing they reference that would be able to fit in a compact cluster development and provide this much needed equity to open space, green space, as has been documented in the Montpelier Green Print and elsewhere. 
Um, so I'm very supportive of this type of development on this parcel that, that my land abuts. Um, but I'm very much against what I perceive to be a cart before the horse approach here um, in rezoning first and then wait and then doing a feasibility study. And I really apologize if it's because I'm dense and just lost um, in my in my career, but I do not understand how a feasibility study, which it sounds like wash um, uh, you know, our Mr. Greer is doing a feasibility study ahead of the rezone, which it's a study to study the feasibility of doing it in Res 9 or any other potential development pattern like planned unit development that can move forward regardless of what the zoning on any piece of land is because it's simply a study. So I'm encouraging very much that we that feasibility study move ahead, present findings that show feasibility in Res 9 or anything else. And we could have an incredible development back there that's housing that satisfies the need to preserve open space and access on the south side of town and doesn't take away what I believe is one of the city's biggest problems. If this rezones as Res 9 and the Habitat for Humanities proposal is not feasible for complete, what's to keep a completely different development from going through there that does not adhere to any of these high principles that uh, we hope to see with Habitat for Humanities project, but instead sold off and build to any standard that Res 9 meets, driver elsewhere, that doesn't quite preserve open space to the same extent. So thank you. That's really my, my main point. I hope we can not put the cart before the horse feasibility study and make decisions based on that rather than do a reason first. Thanks, Dayton. And and I can assure you that we will be sure to think of that. We're not thinking of just one project. We'll be thinking about yeah, about what it means to, to have the zoning that way. Uh, uh, Joe? You're muted. Sorry about that. Um, I had a question for Zachariah and um, I just want to find out how many units are you proposing for this development? And I assume this is all going to be on the flat part of the land. That's correct, Joe. Yeah, we're uh, the feasibility study will ultimately determine um, how many units can actually be built up there. But uh, we are hoping to build as many as possible. Um, 50 would be a great starting place. OK, and then have you actually done a soils test yet? I'm just kind of curious. We have not done a soils test. OK, that's just one of the recommendations I'm, I'm an appraiser by by background and that's one of the things we always look at first is like okay can we even do anything on this lot so uh, that was not in when we initiated the so we applied for a community development block grant for planning um it's a federal grant so we're it uh, holds us to a very high standard of um basically exploring the feasibility of this project and I believe that would probably be a part of the environmental review, and that was not one of the pieces that was suggested as part of the environmental review. Right now, it's just uh, an uh, archaeological resource assessment, which we've already started to do. Gotcha. Thank you. And we started to do that because it needs to happen before the snow comes, so <laughs> that was that, that had to start early. Exactly. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. Yeah, thanks, Joe. Uh, I think I, I noticed the person's your name is DCH011. It's yeah, Dana. And I also abut on Colonial Drive on the other side of Dayton and Hillary. And we also use those woods frequently for walking. And so I was also happy to hear echo a lot of the the positivity about 50% of the the land being set aside. And just would like to regardless of who ends up developing that piece of land, it would be nice if that easement was still considered if it was sold. So um, I guess that's, and I hear the need for housing and support that, but having that green space is also important to us. Thanks, Dana. Uh, Tyler? Uh, great, thank you. And I apologize for jumping in prematurely earlier. Um, to speak to sort of the individual 
project circumstances. I uh, work in construction professionally, and I would urge the framing of this question not as cart and horse, but as chicken and egg. Feasibility of a project and the zoning go hand in hand. And as it pertains to the habitat project, I think knowing that the zoning will allow us or allow the project to move forward uh, is a huge part of whether or not it's feasible. So if the organization can save tens of thousands of dollars in um, feasibility study costs by knowing the zoning decision ahead of time, that's a huge uh, decision that can get made early on. In terms of the larger sort of beyond a single project zoning, I would just urge folks to uh, think carefully about the amount of developable, developable land there is near the downtown center in Montpelier. It's not easy to find that, and this parcel offers a, a very good long-term opportunity with some careful planning and careful consideration about everybody's uses. Thank you. Thanks, Tyler. Uh, Mont Mini, is that, is that right? Uh, yes, hi. Uh, Mark and Tracy Mont Mini were uh, land abutters um, to the uh, piece of land in, in question that Habitat for Humanity is looking at. And we just wanted to echo uh, Dayton's comments. Um, I think whether it's horse and cart or, or chicken and egg, it seems to us that, you know, a final decision on the zoning could be postponed and, until the feasibility study is returned. I understand they might need to know what the answer would be, but it seems to us a little bit backwards to give them an answer and to go ahead and rezone it before the facilities or the uh, feasibility study comes back. If for some reason it does fall through, pardon the expression, open Pandora's box for the next developer that comes along with deeper pockets that can develop it. So we're not opposed to the, the development. Um, certainly we lived in Montpelier long enough to know about the housing shortages, um, but it, it just seems to us that, you know, the, the final decision on, on making the, the zoning change could, could wait until the feasibility study is returned, not unlike the, the conversation that that took place earlier uh, with Mr. Greer. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we've we've had a request for people to state their full names for purposes of the um, newspaper. Um, just so throw that out there for people. It's not it's not something that I'm hugely concerned about. But uh, Brian Evans. Good evening, everyone. I'm Brian Evans. I'm on the Montpelier Housing Task Force. I do not live close to this uh, plot, but I am an advocate for more housing. Um, I do want to just add my name to the support of uh, changes to the zoning that uh, allow more housing, because we are definitely in that crunch. I do want to point out to those uh, that like to use private land that they have access to, just keep in mind that if zoning doesn't change in this seller, sells to somebody that decides that you do not want to, they do not want to allow that access anymore, you lose that access. So you know, it's nice that Habitat for Humanity is, is saying that they would like to keep that open. If, if they back out of the project and this goes to a private landowner that decides that they don't want to allow that access, there's nothing the city or we could do about that. So just keep that in mind. It's, it should be not a forefront question in this, in my opinion. So thank you. Thanks, Brian. Do we have, uh, do we have okay, looks like we have uh, Glenn. Yeah, hi, um, I am not an abutter, but I am an abutter to abutters. Uh, and I use uh, the land uh, as described for daily walks. Um, I, um, I would really hate to lose that access, um, but the project as described by Zachariah sounds like almost the best case long-term scenario to me. Um, and 
I think that there are a few different ways that we could get to worst case scenarios for me, which would be, um, for example, what was just described, losing access because uh, the private landowner chooses to post the land and say, you can't go there. Um, all that said, I think I am uh, landing overall in support of the zoning change, despite my confusion with the process. Um, I think that it's uh, a project worth pursuing and I understand the, the rationale for it. Um, thank you for holding the hearing. I expect I'll be at the next one too. Thanks, Glenn. Do we have anyone else? Anyone else for the, the Northfield? Uh, yes, I, Curry, I, this is John Campbell. I'm trying to raise my hand. I can't. <laughs> with my hand, I guess. It's what okay. happens when old guys sit there and try to use IT? It's all right. You go ahead, John. Okay, John Campbell. I also live on, on Pleasant Street, and and actually, Glenn just uh, said something which is interesting. He said basically the confusion of the project. Um, I, I think that everyone here uh, that is viewing this is concerned about the housing crisis. No question about that. And yeah, being an abutter or using that park is nice. And yes, everyone's right. Uh, are the, the individuals who said that the landowner can close it at any time. That's correct. But what we're really looking at is changing the zoning laws in this city and how we can, how, how you go about doing it. I have not seen any major, any plan really uh, here to tell to give you all guidance as to whether it's worthy to make that change, which is a very uh, important uh, decision on your part. Uh, Zach had, had met with the landowners or the abutters uh, and one of the things that he had mentioned and told us is that this is gonna be a very, very expensive project and that they're probably gonna to have to partner with people, which does bring that concern is, okay, what exactly are we doing here? What happens if, if Habitat can't afford it and it does go to other developers? Have we gone ahead and made changes to the very important zoning laws um, under the, uh, the thoughts that, that this was going to be a Habitat for Humanity project and then turn out to be something totally different? So uh, I, again, I, I, I understand about the concern about feasibility. Yeah, you wanna know if the zoning is going to be changed. Um, I believe very strongly though, that you need to know um, what is possible before you go ahead and make a huge major policy change. So I would just urge the, um, the board to consider that. Thanks, John. Yeah, you may not have been here before, but, but at the beginning of it, I kind of introduced this as saying that uh, we are going to consider this not based on any project or any parcel. We're, we're going to be considering it based on the city plan. That's mostly what guides us. And it's and also our own thoughts about how we'd like to adjust the bylaws to meet the kind of vision that the planning commission and, and the city council, of course, uh, is, has for the city. So that's, that's what's mostly on the forefront of our mind. We're thinking very much about, not about what a particular project will do, but what, what we think is right for um, zoning in the city to address housing and where it's the most appropriate, et cetera, et cetera. But, and again, following the, the city plan. Great. Thanks, Kirby. Appreciate it. Yeah, sure. Uh, it looks like uh, Zach has something. Uh, Kirby, I just wanted to thank, thank you for the opportunity to um, discuss this with folks. Uh, we've been very open and, and wanting to engage the public and our neighbors on this process. We know it's a big project and there are lots of complicated things about it. Um, wanted to invite folks to join us for a, a Capital Area Neighborhood hosted meeting, a virtual meeting next Monday, 5.30, to talk about the project so we can learn more about it. And of course, we are very much open to everybody's suggestions and working with you. We know everybody's not going to be happy, but um, I think that's the nature of a compromise. So um, thanks again. Thanks, Zach. Does, it, does anyone else have anything on this one? Okay. Going to move on to the next item, which is a proposal to reduce the side setbacks in Res 9 from 15 feet to 10 feet. Anyone? Okay. Uh, Joe, go ahead. I guess my concern is um, I believe that this was started. Uh, by was it the request of the planning commission? 
No, not this one. This one came up. Um, they came up a couple of times. I don't have the, a specific property to point to, but since 2018, we'd had a couple of people who had uh, Res 9 properties and wanted to do projects, and we just kept seeing this side setback come up in certain uh, certain ones. But as I said, Res 9, for those of you who don't know, it, it's, it's in most of the, you know, if you go up Terrace Street, you're going to hit Res 9. If you go up Northfield Street, you're going to hit uh, Res 9. If you go up Berlin Street, you're going to hit Res 9. Um, if you go up Main Street, you're going to hit Res 9. So it's kind of, it's that that lower density, single family home neighborhoods. Um, okay, I just was curious on, on where that came from. Yeah, no, I don't have a specific one. It had come up uh, two or three times though. You know, Clarendon Ave, I think, was one where somebody just had a project um, that happened to highlight it, and we noticed it a couple of times. It wasn't really prevalent. Um, you know, I'm not jumping up and down saying this is one that really has to get changed, but it came up, so I thought it was worth entertaining and having the comments. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Joe. Do we have, do we have anyone else uh, on the setback? There's nine setback question. Okay. Uh, so number five is uh, a change to setbacks on property lines abutting the rail line for, uh, for properties in the Eastern Gateway uh, in the, the farm and factory neighborhood. Uh, I know Mike had some, Mike, Mike provided us with some uh, emailed feedback on that and he said it's available publicly. Um, he has copies there and yeah. Um, Alicia, Alicia is here to probably give a quick summary from her perspective. Okay, great. Uh, Alicia, welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so I, I work for Malone Properties, who's an, a property owner in that area for several different parcels um, in the Eastern Gateway. Um, zoning district and a couple of things about it is uh one a lot of the historic buildings there or the buildings that are currently there have about zero foot setback to the property line um some of them i'm not sure they're even fully on the property um but the the zoning uh regulations now require 20 foot setbacks for front and side and 30 foot for the rear and I, I understand kind of the area that that's coming from, the industrial use, you wanna have larger setbacks. Our concern is that it's kind of limiting our um, potential use for the rail lines. And we're not saying that all of the property lines do we want to have um, the zero or five foot setback, but just the ones abutting that rail line. Um, and then, um, so we did talk with the, the trans rail division they're open for negotiations uh, as far as every project you can discuss with them and they can review. So that's why um, in Mike's staff comments, there was a five foot maximum waiver uh, for property setback. Um, and then we had asked that if we, if a developer or a abutting um, property to a rail line wanted to have a zero foot setback, and could negotiate directly with the rail line division for maintenance of a building if it was put on a zero foot setback, that that could be a possibility. We just, the way the, the waivers are written now, there is no front yard um, waiver setback. So all buildings have to be 20 foot setback from a rail line or um, a, any other line, but this specifically rail line. <clears throat> and um, so we just wanted to make sure that we didn't, we allowed for options in the regulations, um, but we're not asking for any at this time. We're just trying to figure out um, that we have those possibilities in the future. We are looking at doing some changes in that area. Um, and it's, it's not really a feasibility study or not. It's just the way that they're written really limits the potential use for rails in the area. Thanks, Alicia. 
Uh, does anyone have any um, comments or questions for Alicia or Mike? Okay. okay I'm going to move on. Uh, the next, the next uh, question is uh, about uh, new planned unit development rules uh, for the general PUD and for footprint requests. Anyone have questions about the PUDs? Just so you know, I mean, we, we talk about we talk about PUDs a lot, uh, and and the the zoning that was just changed a few years ago added a lot about PUDs, and we're we're look, we're re looking at that as Mike said before in the summary. Uh, but this idea of, of using PUDs to to have more development at the same and at the same time have more open space is actually really great. So the people who were who were thinking of the the habitat project, I think, yeah. PUDs and doing better, doing a better job with PUDs. I think some we, we might all want so that we can have our open space and we can also have our, our higher density in areas where we, where we need that too. But uh, if there's no questions, we can move on. Uh, the next one is the removal of required PUD language in new neighborhood and conservation PUDs. Any questions about that or comments? Okay. The next change is the removable removal of density uh, residential density requirements from the riverfront and res uh, 1500 districts. Um, this would make them uh, similar to the urban center one urban center two and urban center three. And, uh, I'll say right now this was a change that came from the planning commission. Uh, I see your hand Joe. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm just kind of concerned on what the rationale was behind this. Uh, is it just to mass more housing, more density? I'm just trying to figure out where the rationale comes from for this. Do you mean to answer that one, Mike, or you want to go for it? Uh, it's, it's up to you. I can give the general answer, and then I'll let Kirby uh, and the Planning Commission speak up in, in either, you know, kind of support or kind of defend the, the reasoning why. So um, what we find sometimes in these urban areas, uh, you know, more built out area is you'll have uh, a building. Um, and so uh, you may get a market analysis that goes and says, um, and this is actually true, you know, 30% of everyone who lives in Montpelier, they live alone, they're people living alone. So most people think, well, it's families living in houses, but a lot of people just live as, as you know, a, a single person in a house or a single person in an apartment. And 30% of our, our residents live by themselves. Um, so sometimes a market analysis will come in and say, look, we, we've got a lot of a two unit and three unit apartments. We've got a lot of homes, but we need our studio apartments and one bedroom apartments to fill that need for that group of people who want to live alone or who do live alone. Um, but what happens is when they get to a structure, the structure in the zoning is set up there. I could put, I'll, I'll throw out a number. I, I could put 16 studios in there, but the zoning says, you know, I can only get eight units. So because I've got this box, I'll just fill it with two, two bedroom units instead, because I, I don't want to lose the, the amount of development potential. So, the idea is if you can split these two away and just go through and say, we're going to look at how big of a box, how big of a structure can you build? And then we will, um, rather than necessarily count the number of units. So I guess that's, uh, it, it, I hope that clar clarifies it a little bit. Um, just if you've got a certain size building, you can fit, you know, uh, 16 studios or you can fit eight two bedrooms. And its impact on the neighborhood, it's an identical looking building. The impact on the neighborhood is less, um, there is, is virtually the same between the two. So um, that I guess is the, the reason why a lot of communities in the, in, or some communities in the country are shifting towards these form-based codes. 
Yeah, and that's 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 what I would say for the the policy um, reasoning is uh, we we have some interest in moving away from de using density as as something in the toolkit. I think it's misunderstood a lot of the time, and uh, especially in these areas around downtown, like what we're looking at with this proposal, uh, we want density. We want people. So. Uh, Something like density is like needlessly gets in the way of, of what we're what we're what we're going for, uh, what the city's going for. But but I think there's there's a philosophical part too where it's just like if we can start thinking about uh, zoning in terms of how our community looks and how we you know what we want from the community and less about like putting a quanti quantitative limits on the number of people and the number of units. Um, we think that long term that's better, and and a and a lot of what we're a, a lot of you know what this idea came out of is is how plant how planning as a profession is changing and evolving, and there's um, materials put out by think tanks and even the state of Vermont recently that have uh, suggested uh, that cities move away from uh, density. Um, so I think I think it's just an exciting thing for us to to do. This is we've done it with the urban centers, and this is just expanding that out to the areas nearby that are like the urban center. But uh, I gotta say, it's it's I, I see this maybe the first steps of like actually in the very long term moving the city away from thinking about density, thinking about what we really want the city to look like, as opposed to using these proxy things. And I guess my comment here is do we have any examples either in Vermont or? You said that there are some studies throughout the United States. I don't know whether you're talking San Francisco, New York, you know, some other far more denser uh, areas that you can cite as examples as something that's been done in, in, in this format. Well, it's it's our very own downtown is as an example. There's okay. not density. There's the the three urban center areas that make the downtown don't have density caps. And I. Uh, but, but there's a there's a state document um, that uh, I could try to find the link and I'll try to put it in the chat here. That, yeah, and, that, I, and I don't know the specifics. I, I but I, I do know there are a number of communities that have tried that have moved towards form based codes, but I don't know if they've fully gone there. I know Newport, Winooski, uh, South Burlington. I know has been looking at it. Um, yeah. <clears throat> so there are other communities in the state that have moved towards it, but. Sometimes form-based codes are hybrid, and I and I can't honestly tell you whether or not they have fully gone. Um, I, I would suspect Winooski would probably be the most likely candidate for one that Winooski and Newport, having known the the planner for both of those communities, he was the same gentleman for both, and and I would have suspected that it's probably pretty close to this same idea too. And I. I guess my concern is, Mike, you certainly remember when there was a 23 unit apartment building proposed over on Sibley. I mean, under these requirements, it looks like that would certainly have not had any sort of resistance under this new form based code. And I'm just wondering about the potential for abuses of, of stuff like this. What do you guys, what do you say to that? Well, the the Sibley one certainly that was a it met the zoning actually it it, it met all the density requirements. Um, I can't remember if that was before or after the new zoning was passed. I think it was before. It may have been before, but it met the zoning that was in place at at the time. Um, really, what becomes very important then um, is to make sure that the the bulk and massing because that. Uh, what Sibley, depending on where where you look on Sibley, because Sibley's kind of this, you get close down to the Barry Street and the buildings are very big. You get up to the top of the hill on uh, Sibley Street and you, you end up with single family ranches and smaller structures. So this one happened to be at, you know, kind of that transition point where uh, it, it, it would have been a very large building, not compared to the ones downhill, but big compared to the ones uphill and the project ended up going away anyways. But that's um, what's important is to make sure you have those bulk and mac massing rules correct. So uh, your building footprint requirements. And I believe we, we, you know, under the old rules, we didn't have building footprint requirements. We now do. Um, so we, we have a couple of additional things that can go in to help 
um, alleviate some of these, uh, you know, again, if, if you've got the bulk and massing right, then you can't get a giant building um, because the bulk and massing won't let you. Um, okay, and, and then I guess the next question is, so would this be the, based on what Kirby replied, so is this sort of a starter district? Is this something that you plan to roll out throughout the city at some point? I think it's, I think it's possible. I mean, that we're talking like a really slow incremental thing. So I, I have no idea. It's probably, I mean, if I don't, we're, we're, we're hoping to um, just look for ways to, for people to see that, that density is a bit of a red herring um, in, and I think, you know, so, so in my mind, yes, like making these changes, I don't, you know, it's going to be, it's only going to be helpful. I think it's only, it's only going to stop possibly like potentially stop um, some development that we want uh, from, from being, from being stopped or obstructed, you know, um, because this is, these are areas that we certainly do want to see housing development in. Uh, and people will see that that you know there's no harm that comes from looking at it differently and not relying on density so much. Okay, that that, yeah, that that does help a little bit. It's it's kind of hard to conceptualize, you know, because we I'm so used to looking at zoning from one standpoint, and this is like a whole new <laughs> mindset. Yeah, that's that's the hope. That's the hope. Um, I've noticed in my time on the planning commission that people often get uh, upset over zoning is what people focus on when they're upset when it's not normally like the actual like, thing they're worried about. They're worried about their community changing in some way or, or some undesirable development happening or something, but it's not that people focus on zoning or the density stuff a lot. I just think it will help our conversations if we um, focus less on it. But I see it's kind of a paradigm difference. I get that. And I, I guess my question is, what's the goal of the planning commission at this point? How many additional units do you foresee? If this were to be enacted, have you guys thought about what the end, end game is on this? For those districts, I don't, I don't, we don't know. It's, okay. It's, I, yeah. Yeah, I just thought it might be something to put into the conversation. Mm -hmm. Okay, do we have any other comments about this? Yeah, we do have Sandy Vitsum who is here uh, live and she wanted to give some comments. Mike, am I allowed to take off my mask if I'm boosted? Yeah. Thank yes. you. Hi there. Okay. Um, I don't know a number of people on the um, planning commission now, so I'm just going to briefly introduce myself and I'll say up ahead, ahead of time that I will try to limit myself to two minutes, but I don't think that will happen. But if I go over, please know I'm trying to end. Um, I have lived in Vermont for a long time and uh, I have been a practicing architect for about 40 years. Um, I went to a total of six years of school, uh, architecture and engineering, and I had a concentration in urban planning and also in urban economics. Uh, I served on design review for many years, and I actually uh, participated in one of the last truly uh, from scratch master plans, I would think it was shortly before the year 2000. Um, and uh, I have worked with form-based codes in Saratoga, in Indiana, in Michigan, and other states. So I have probably for 20 years where it's been around for a longer time. So I'm very familiar with form-based um, zoning. I'm gonna try to just say a couple of very brief process-related points I wanna make, and then focus in on eight, your, your item number eight. The first is the lack of notice that you have given, uh, or I should say, have not, so you have not given to residents. It sounds as if, uh, Mike, this letter went out to both apartment residents and to landowners. The landowner. Yeah. So in a lot of these districts, 
there are a lot of apartments, and it says residents here, but it didn't go to residents. So um, I, I don't think that is a democratic way to do this. A lot of owners, uh, you know, multi-building owners, um, landlords in town don't even live in Montpelier. So this could have been sent to them and no one would know. So th that's a major problem. The second thing is the letter that came to the residents was dated November 9th, but it didn't get into my mail until November 19th, which was Friday at five o'clock before the Thanksgiving week. And there's really no chance to talk to neighbors about this. The letter that came had no details no graphics um and so someone could look at this and think oh my gosh i'm getting ready for thanksgiving not go through a lot of research uh to understand what the heck it means for their them or their property or their family i, I it's just not acceptable to me to have that low level of process and to count this as one of just two meetings on the subject um before some significant changes would be made to our zoning code uh, ordinance and then have to be changed through a very laborious process if in fact mistakes are made and you know sore thumbs are are built in the town um there there really should have been examples for item number uh four setting back the setbacks i a lot of people don't even know what um zone they were in when they when they would look at something like this um you know, I don't know why you would try to change something when the majority is already conforming. Why wouldn't you use a variance rule for that? Then your items number six and seven, new planned unit development rules. That's huge. That's really huge. I personally, I've worked on two PUDs in Montpelier, and I think that would be nice to change them. But to just like not even mention that, and then people, people have no idea what you're doing. And then I have to tell you to try to find the details on my peers website it's very difficult, especially for someone who doesn't use the website professionally. Very difficult. I, it's, this is, as I said, not democratic. Um, now I'm going to move on to uh, eight. Uh, removal of residential density requirements. I understand the, the intention behind this. I think it's a noble intention. But the abuse for massing um, form-based codes, it, the, the potential for abuse is huge. We've already seen some pretty serious sore thumbs built. And what happens in a town, you probably know this, is once it's abused, that abused, abusive <laughs> transgression starts to become the norm. It only takes one or two other buildings on a street to significantly change what is considered the norm for the street. It plummets uh, housing values. Um, it, it, it's just poor, poor thinking. I would, if you are gonna seriously think about this, you need to pay for an, a consultant, an architect to build this out. When these started to be discussed in the last zoning update, which was about four years ago, maybe three, four years ago, a group of us actually paid to have in, um, uh, I think it was in Revit, the build out that would be possible um, on some of the smaller streets. And it was horrendous what it would do to the street and what to do to the people who live there. Um, it, and what, you know, the character of, of Montpelier and it's it, the resources, you. It, it's unbelievable to me that someone would even have a first discussion about this and then answer the question that they don't know how many residential units could be added. And I totally agree that units are not a great way to think about this, but you seem to be forgetting that 16 studio units use exponentially more uh, resources um, than fewer large units. I'm going to use my next door neighbor. I live on Loomis Street. Uh, so 10 Loomis was originally a single family house, big house. Uh, could Let's say it had a family of seven because people used to have more children back then. Think about how much uh, water and sewer that building uses. 
It is now 15 studio apartments, which is fine. It's part of the neighborhood, but there's only one like building like that on that whole street. 15 studio units uses far more than a linear equivalent of of water and sewer. I, I, it's very important for you to understand that because we have not done a true master plan update. I think, Mike, 15 years, maybe 20, a true from scratch master plan update where there's a committee. Okay, that's 13 years, almost 14. And think about what has happened in the last 14 years. And I think that our new residents of Montpelier deserve to practice being on a committee and having a voice and looking at everything together. I don't think Montpelier has the first clue how much water and sewage capacity we have, including the new demands coming from Berlin Street. That's huge because Berlin, because they're using our water and sewer, can go to town for their residential developments up there. And uh, they could put to shame any commercial uses for their water. So uh, we have no clue as a municipality what the water use could look like. And you can't just sort of hope that it'll be just a few people that take advantage of this. I think um, 20 years ago before Vermont, New England in general became highly uh, desirable as a place to live, you could just say, you know, statistically, oh, well, there will only be one or two sore thumbs and one or two high demands on our resources in this neighborhood. But that's not true now. And I know there's a huge amount of demand for, for tiny homes and tiny home communities. I wish that there could be more in Montpelier, but we have to think it through. Otherwise, what ha will happen to a lot of Vermont will happen to us, which is all of a sudden, we don't have enough infrastructure that includes schools, that includes our budget for roads, that includes um, plowing and road maintenance crews, that includes water and sewer. And then you have- Andy, we're running out of time, so- um, I'm sorry. Just wrap it up. So, okay, I am going to wrap it up, but it seems, it seems unconscionable to me to just chat about this and start to go in this direction without a new master plan. The third thing I just want to say super briefly is um, historic review districts exist to protect as an extra layer of protection about from undisciplined um, development. And if you are going to even consider some of these changes, I, I mean, I don't know if you understand that you're affecting the historic lane shot neighborhood, which is relatively small workers houses and a huge amount of um, completely residential area that, that, that you, I think you need to consider extending the historic district review um, district because uh, really this is gonna put a huge pressure on development. So um, thank you for your time. And I, sorry, I went over two, two minutes. I don't even know what I did, thanks. Yeah, yeah, I'll let you go over a while there, but I, I was under thank the you. belief that you were maybe the last person um does does anyone else have anything to say for tonight we will have another hearing in two weeks yeah. looks like we looks yeah. like we do have someone else we have about seven we'll have, minutes left yeah tonight. Well, we and do have somebody have yeah we do have somebody else here who wanted to provide comments in the number nine section and i think kate okay. to talk about number nine as well okay great uh uh, so, so let's go ahead and yeah, we'll proceed to number nine. And um, uh, Kate, why don't you go ahead and, and start us off? Hi there. I have two comments on number nine. Um, one is particular to the the proposal to um, split the zoning of parks and recreation, and I just wanted to um, put in my support for that. Um, I'm part of a group of volunteers who's been trying to organize the creation of a dog park in Montpelier. Um, we found a couple of potential sites that we've been looking at. And when we inquired to the planning commission or the planning department about the permits required, we were told that um, dog parks are not a permitted use anywhere in the city of Montpelier um, under our current zoning. And so this 
split um, to kind of create a separate definition for recreational fields is is one way to potentially make that possible. Um, and so I definitely support it. I would just put in a plug though, um, if you look at the, the use table that Mike has in the write-up, um, it, it includes a number of, of zones where it would be a permitted use and then other zones where it'd be conditional use. I would suggest that the rural zone be a permitted use, but I don't know what the, you know, the thinking was in terms of um, picking picking which zones would would allow it and which weren't. So that, that's those are my, my comments in support of of making it possible for us to have a dog park at some point in the future of Montpelier. Um, and my second comment is about the the shading, and I'm curious to understand why the change in the solar shading is being proposed. Um, it seems like kind of uh, well, so the, the, the proposed change is, is that shading would only be considered for existing photovoltaic um, or solar hot water installation. But obviously, if we want to increase the amount of solar in the city of Montpelier, we want um, to allow future installations of solar and not be shaded. So um, I don't know, Mike or Kirby, if anyone has some background on why that change is being suggested. I'll just be curious to know more. Yeah, so I can jump in to go and, and fill in. So the way the current rules are written, you cannot shade any walls, yards, or roofs. And so it was really getting to the point, especially in a lot of these close neighborhoods. Uh, you know, we had a project in the Res 3000 neighborhood, so it's a relatively compact neighborhood, and somebody was going to put a new structure into a vacant lot. And uh, the question came up with the new structure. Um, it was going to cast a shadow. I mean, obviously, with these 3000 square foot lots, it doesn't take much to cast a shadow onto the yard um in the neighboring property and even though it was going to have a very minor in you know kind of infringement on the property it was going to you know at in in december 23rd it was going to cast a shadow that would cross for you know a, a period of a couple of hours across the lowest part of the the um first story and so the question was you know um we're gonna you know if we follow the strict strict letters of things, then that would mean you really couldn't build any new housing infill because you would at in December cast a shadow, even if there are trees, which was the case in this property, even if there are trees, even if there's a hill behind you, even if there are a lot of conditions, it was really was kind of like what the, the policy question then was brought back to the planning commission because that that project's already done. It was approved by the DRB. But the DRB did want to have us look at the rule and look at the policy to make a decision what specifically is the policy that we're trying to protect because um, not sh allowing anyone to shade your neighbor's lawn really is going to stop just about everything and so can we can you know what's our policy interest first and then how, what rules can we draft that make that a reasonable way of, of administering it because the way the rules are kind of set up now it wasn't really making a, a great deal of sense so our thought was with this the proposal would be um, existing and proposed, existing and permitted um, PV or, or, or any solar facility, whether it's PV or um, hot water, you know, you wouldn't be allowed to shade those. But um, certainly if you if there are recommendations as to other other lines, I think the Planning Commission would, would be open to it. But that was where they kind of drew the line was like, look, we want housing, we want it compact, and we'll protect these. Um, and that that's the why. Okay, well, I, I agree that, you know, I, I'm not, I wasn't totally clear on how the shading regulations are enforced or, you know, considered in the, in the permit application process, but I guess I would just suggest that maybe there's a middle ground here that's like not shading, you know, all or nothing, <laughs> and maybe it's like just grooves or I don't know what, what the the other paths might be, but we do want to preserve, you know, in addition to be able to allow infill, infill housing, we also want to be able to allow people to have solar access if they want it. So those are my only two comments. Thanks, Kate. 
Uh, and, I, and I think there's one more person. Is that right, Mike? Yes. Okay. So we're going to we'll make this the last one. Um, then uh, I'll look for a motion to adjourn, and we will pick it back up December 13th. Go ahead, sir. Hello. My name is Thomas Weiss. I'm a resident of Montpelier, and I thank you for the opportunity to provide comments today. Um, I'm also going to talk about Section 3206, which is uh, solar access. I ask you not to amend that section as proposed. So we'll restrict access to sunlight for both energy and for growing food. I explain, I've got some written notes which take me longer to read or go over than I have time for. Uh, Mike has a copy of them, which he will send out to the commissioners, uh, hopefully tomorrow or when he gets the chance. Um, in those comments, I explain why I oppose the amendment, and then I offer suggestions for a different amendment that will actually increase access to sunlight. I find that the amendment is contrary to decisions made by the Planning Commission when they developed the 2018 zoning regulations, it's contrary to the master plan, and it's contrary to goals of sustainability and of the Global uh, Warming Solutions Act. Uh, the proposal to amend Section 32.6a, well, that section creates a right of solar access, and the proposed amendment no longer preserves that right. Section 32.6c applies the right of solar access to growing food, even though that is not explicit in the section, and to active and passive solar energy systems. The proposed amendment removes the right of existing access from growing food and from passive solar systems now and in the future, and it removes the right of existing access from future active solar systems. Um, the Planning Commission affirmed future access was important when they developed the 2018 regulations, and I explain why and how uh, in, in the written letter. And they also used the phrase to reduce the ability to use solar, which implies or re requires that access be protected into the future, even though it's not actually being used now. The proposed amendment is limited to solar energy devices. Passive solar does not use devices. So therefore, uh, passive solar, even if it's existing now, will not be protected by the proposed amendment. The, uh, it's contrary to the master plan. I list seven goals that are in the current master plan that are not supported by this proposed amendment. One of them, I'll go over now, is to ensure that food sources are affordable and derived from secure and reliable suppliers. Putting more shade onto a property reduces the viability of the growing of food. And the most secure and reliable supplier is an individual growing food affordably at home. And this proposal will reduce that ability. Um, I do have some alternative suggestions for amending it put growing food specific, uh, explicitly into the section, right of solar access for walls and roofs should be expanded to at least 45 degrees, and I explain why on that. And solar access for yards should exist for a yard in any orientation, any location, any yard. Um, in conclusion, I believe that the proposed amendment of section 3206 is short-sighted our goals, our need for sustainability require a longer range vision. We need to keep open our future options for homegrown food and for solar access. We need to preserve the access that now exists so that it can be used in the future. Please do not adopt the proposed amendment to section 326. I ask that you consider and adopt my alternative suggestions for that section. Thank you very much for listening to these comments. And uh, I, as I said, I have written comments. And I do have an extra comment on uh, the interjected comment on 
uh, trying to rezone the upper portions of Liberty Street uh, back in when the 2018 regulations were being developed. There were reasons why it was left at the level it is now, and it wasn't a more dense reason. I'd have to look at my notes from that time to find them. And I ask that you not consider any other changes on Liberty Street in this package other than the one down at the lower end that's already been discussed. Uh, uh, the changes to the upper portion were controversial then and would still be controversial now, and I doubt that you have time enough to actually go into them in the time schedule that you've outlined. So again, thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. And we're, uh, we'll make sure we check out your the materials, Michael, forward those, I'm sure. Okay. Uh, thanks, everyone, for coming. And uh, we're, we're a little over time, so we'll go ahead and adjourn. And we'll be here again December 13th. Do we have a motion to adjourn? I move to adjourn. Okay. Motion from Ariane. Do we have a second? Second. Do we have a second? Second, second. from Dave. All right. Second from Gabe. Those in favor of adjourning, say aye. 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 We oppose. Okay. We are adjourned. Thanks, everyone.